Welcome to another show of this week. We return after having been away for a while with yet another show which highlights our main stories of the week. In our first story, the UN Security Council adopts Resolution 2304 authorizing additional 4,000 UN peacekeeping troops in South Sudan. Here is the report. The United Nations Security Council on Friday, August 12th, adopted a resolution to deploy a regional protection force to the South Sudanese capital of Juba under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter. The force of 4,000 troops has been mandated to provide a secure environment in and around Juba using all necessary means to protect civilians as well as the United Nations and other humanitarian workers. According to the American Ambassador David Pressman, the force was created in response to the collapse of security in Juba. While we hoped to achieve unity on this vote, let's be clear. We have had Security Council unity on UNMIS for some time, and one only need look at what unity has achieved with respect to UNMIS's ability to operate on the ground. UNMIS is facing daily threats, daily impediments, and daily and sometimes deadly challenges. Security Council unity has not solved that. Additional authorities and resources might. The resolution, which condemns the fighting in Juba from the 8th to the 11th of July, among other things, encourages countries in the region, the Africa Union Peace and Security Council, and IGAD to continue firmly engaging with South Sudanese leaders to address the current political crisis. Chinese Ambassador Liu Ji said the Regional Protection Force must coordinate with South Sudan's government to carry out its work in a way that is truly useful for peace. The Regional Protection Force in its deployment process must conduct full consultations with the Transitional Government of National Unity in South Sudan on its specific issues and obtain consensus and coordination from the government and carry out its work in a way that is truly useful for peace in South Sudan and conducive to the maintenance of the stability of the transitional government. The resolution received 11 votes in its favor with four abstentions. Will the council bear the responsibility for the safety and security of those forces? And would the troop contributing countries agree to send their personnel to countries without coordinating and consulting with those governments? South Sudanese ambassador Akwe Bona Malwal expressed his government's rejection of the just adopted resolution. The adoption of this resolution goes against the basic principle of UN peacekeeping operation, which is the concern of the main parties to the conflict and also goes against the UN Charter, which urges members of the United Nations to respect sovereignty, territorial integrity, and political independence of other states. Thousands have been displaced after a recent outbreak of conflict in South Sudan. Earlier in the week, observers of South Sudan's political scene were interviewed on Radio Mirai's Democracy in Action. They spoke about South Sudan's reaction to an eager communique adopted on August 5th in Addis. The Assembly of Heads of State and Government of the IGAD Plus held its second extraordinary summit meeting on the 5th of August 2016 in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia and deliberated on the, of course, situation in the Republic of South Sudan. And the meeting came up with a number of, a communique where there are recommendations within. So joining me in the studio for us to look into these recommendations and how it will impact on the peace. Now, to begin with, this latest development, what do you think about it? Rajab, would you like to go first? This uh, latest development, of course, indicates the concerns and uh, interest of the region to contribute to uh, restoration of peace and stability in South Sudan. Uh, their discussions and resolutions that came out in the communique uh, actually indicate that uh, the region is concerned about what's happening in South Sudan 
And uh, we have also seen that uh, from the side of the South Sudanese uh, government and leadership, there is also a kind of a change of tone to be able to allow for deployment of, uh, uh, of a force from the region. Yes, Harriet. This communique is like a roadmap on, on how the whole process of uh, uh, the deployment of the troops uh, will happen and uh, also it gives uh, uh, government uh, the upper hand to negotiate, you know, uh, the timelines, the mandate of the force itself, even the size itself. And I think it's a very positive development because over time there's been concern about uh, the protection of uh, citizens and uh, like uh, Rajab just said, uh, the tone of government has softened and I think it's a good sign and uh, we hope that uh, uh, they pick up from there and we, we see positive results from, from you know. How this latest development of the impact of this communique on really moving forward, you know, moving forward together, not moving forward as factions in this peace agreement implementation. Koyang, I give you a chance to, to wind up your thought. Yeah, I, I, I think it's a, it's a great development and uh, we've seen uh, 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 that peace is urgent. Um, and I just like to give examples. I was watching the Rio games and there was the South Sudanese flag, you know, and there's this nostalgia and, and then I said to myself, but we are on the brink of a civil war. So the leadership, know, they know what to do. They know the right thing. Do it together and move this forward. Yes, we, we are hopeful that uh, our, the leaders will take it upon themselves to honor their commitment to, to move forward with the implementation of the peace agreement. That is where our hopes, my hope as a citizen lies. Uh, not so much on the deployment of the force, but so much on what the leaders will do to transform the situation. A week ahead of the World Humanitarian Day, which is commemorated every year on August 19th, the United Nations Humanitarian Chief, Stephen O'Brien, continues to shine a light on those affected by conflict in South Sudan. Here is the story. After his return to New York following a three-day visit to South Sudan, the UN Emergency Relief Coordinator on Wednesday said that humanitarian workers were saving lives while continuing to risk their own in their line of duty. I am appalled that they continue to be harassed, targeted and killed. When I visited last year, 27 of our colleagues had sadly lost their lives and many more were missing and unaccounted for. Today, the number of aid workers killed since December 2013 is 57. This is unacceptable and unconscionable and I urge the President to take immediate action to end the impunity that has prevailed to date. Speaking to journalists, he said that while in South Sudan, he met with President Salva Kiir and expressed his shock at reports of violations. He also called for humanitarians to be granted free access to help those in need. I expressed in clear terms my shock and dismay at the appalling reports of violations committed against civilians during fighting in recent months, including in Juba. In particular, I condemned the heinous acts of sexual violence carried out against women and girls, including by members of the armed forces. I also reiterated the need for humanitarians to be granted free, safe and unhindered access to all people in need, wherever they may be, and for humanitarian workers and their assets to be respected. While in South Sudan, O'Brien traveled to Wau, where he met with displaced communities. He also visited a hospital in Awil, where numbers of those in need was growing. He said the situation in Wau and Awil was just a tip of the iceberg, and that each location where there has been fighting, civilians have been attacked and forcibly displaced. Uh, let's be clear, we will not be able to reach the people who need us and who have needs, and there will be people who uh, suffer, and we will move from being in a f deep food insecurity uh, to worse, but I won't, uh, I won't speculate uh, as to where we go through the international definitions of, of moving beyond that. O'Brien, who met with humanitarian and medical aid workers and several government officials, was visiting South Sudan in an effort to assess the situation on the ground and renew calls for funding. He said the humanitarian response for South Sudan 
was underfunded by over $700 million. Our next piece highlights segments of an interview we conducted with the force commander of the United Nations mission in South Sudan. In recent weeks, UNRWA's force has been asked some telling questions about its readiness and commitment to the challenge of bringing peace to South Sudan. Sometimes stretched to the limit, the military arm of the mission has expended considerable effort in fulfilling its mandate to protect innocent civilians in imminent danger. Following the violent outbreak of fighting in Juba from the 7th and 8th of July, which lasted some five days, but which still goes on in pockets around the country, many have asked, is the force up to the challenge? What did they do during the conflict? And indeed, some have even accused them of not being up to the task. Lieutenant General Andiki is the UNMIS Force Commander, and we sat down with him to find out what the true picture was. He spoke about force readiness, the challenges the force faced, steps taken to protect the over 200,000 internally displaced persons in POC and related sites across the country that his force is responsible for protecting, and dealt with accusations of force failure to act to protect women, amongst others. My name is Lieutenant General Johnson Ndiyeki, I am the force commander of UNMIS. I've been here for the last two months, and the period of which I assess the situation in South Sudan to be uh, currently relatively calm, but very fragile because of the uh, situation that it develops within minutes, as it were, in the last uh, few weeks. The first responsibility of uh, protection of civilians in any given country like South Sudan is the responsibility of the government in place. And therefore, the government of South Sudan has the responsibility to protect the civilians. However, where we have civilians who are uh, under imminent danger and uh, require our protection, our force has always been there to do that. And we are doing that in several uh, areas that we have uh, the the people of South Sudan have run into, and we protect those areas using all means that we have, according to uh, the authorization, authorization that we have been given by the Security Council. And it will not uh, be wise not to say that we have all the necessary uh, required force that can be able to protect the people of South Sudan who are in imminent danger. However, this has stretched the capacity that we have. The capacity we have cannot be able to cover all the areas, and the soldiers have the rules of engagement. Within the rules of engagement, it explains how to use force, including lethal force. We are able to use including lethal force to protect the civilians under imminent danger. I therefore, I call upon uh, the government of South Sudan to be able uh, to assist their civil population as we do uh, assist them. During this crisis of the 7th to, to 12th, yes, UNMIS recorded incidences of uh, sexual violence. This is after the combat that the people who ran to the POC sites were able to narrate what they went through during the combat. And after we realized that the, the crimes were being committed on them, including those who were going to venture outside the POC sites uh, to correct the fire good, going to the market and other areas, we have increased patrols outside the, 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 the routes that they take to the various centers to correct the fire good. Uh, the centers that they go to collect their, their things from the market. And as a mission, and especially uh, me as the force commander, I've taken up the issue with the, the SPRA leadership, who have actually taken action and assured that whoever might have committed the crimes will be investigated and will be brought to book. They have actually informed us that they have formed a general court martial, which will be trying those who have perpetrated crimes against the federal citizens. And we look forward to whatever outcome that will come out of their investigations. I continue to urge them 
to ask their uh, soldiers or the security agencies to restrain and know that these are the people of South Sudan. They require comfort. They require to be protected and the government forces must protect them as we do our part uh, to protect the people of South Sudan. We were not directly engaged in uh, any in the confrontation. However, we were caught in the crossfire. In the crossfire, what I mean is that f uh, shots were being fired over at the Unimis, uh, between the two warring factions. And in the process, actually, Unimis uh, lost two peacekeepers. And uh, at this time also, I take the opportunity to send our condolences to the uh, Chinese uh, peacekeepers that we lost, to their families and everybody, and continue to urge that uh, UNIMIS is here to protect the people of South Sudan and to assist the peace process. We are not here for any party or to be able to engage any party in whatever confrontation. And uh, UNIMIS should never and should never be a target to any of the parties because we are here for peace and we are here to assist the people of South Sudan and the parties to take forward the bills that they have signed. Our Day in the Life segment briefly highlights the work of the United Nations. Today, we meet Reshmi Singh. She is committed, friendly and approachable here is a story about a United Nations peacekeeper from Fiji who has traveled more than 16,000 kilometers to serve in South Sudan. Every waking day comes with different tasks and challenges for Assistant Superintendent Rashmi Singh and her compatriots who work in South Sudan either as UN police, military or corrections officers. Currently tasked with community policing at a protection of civilian site in Juba, Reshmi Singh's job demands an ability of being able to blend in with different cultures and she does this without any reservations. On Wednesday, she and her compatriots were awarded medals in recognition of their work in South Sudan. I'm passionate about women and children. And uh, I'm happy that uh, at the POC sites we get to deal with a lot whilst doing community policing. We interact with a lot of women and children. At the same time, it uh, gives me ways of how to deal with such issues. As a peacekeeper, Reshmi Singh and other uniformed personnel work under various rules which are mainly focused on the protection of civilians. I felt proud that I have been uh, recommended and I have been selected by the United Nations. I was also um, uh, happy that my country had felt that I am uh, capable enough to represent them. After awarding medals to the Fijian personnel, the United Nations Mission in South Sudan Special Representative of the Secretary General, Ellen Margaret Loy, recognized the roles of the uniformed personnel. Your police officers are enabling a safer environment for civilians, including through the protection of women and children in Turit, in Rombe, in Bo, Bao, and here in Yuba. Your corrections officers help manage the holding facility in Malakal and Bentu, which keeps civilians safer while maintaining the rights of people who pose a danger to fellow citizens. And your military officers are backstopping the important work of force headquarters here in Juba. In dis discharging these various tasks, I'm confident in saying that the Fijian contingent punches above its weight. And as Reshmi Singh and others continue to serve with commitment, professionalism and pride, albeit under difficult circumstances, their selflessness to the communities they serve will continue to be a priority. Here we go. 
we end our show with our voices of peace, hoping that we can engage the nation towards peace and reconciliation. We hope you can join us again next week. Looking at the situation in our country, uh, of course at the moment it's very sad because uh, we have so many people suffering and uh, uh, the peace agreement is not moving uh, in a promising manner. But I'm still hopeful that uh, we will get there, we will uh, uh, restore peace and stability in this country. Thank you.